picture on the front with me preaching and put up a chalkboard and had a race course and said the end, <laughs> the finish line or something like that. And, uh, and they, they, they're listening. They understand we're talking about a course. And uh, we're all going to come to the end of our course, the end of our life, and you're going to be evaluated on how you ran the course. So we need to know what is our course. And to do that, we studied what was Paul's course, because we're to be followers of Paul. Once we saw his course, we asked the question, what is our course? We as a church. And if you'll remember, one of the things that we said as a church is that we are to be a broadcast community, uh, a broadcast network to the community. Uh, as a church, collectively, we need to get the gospel out. Amen. Well, that's never going to happen until now that we're on the final section of this and even the final part of our messages. We're talking about what is your course. And as an individual, you're part of the body of Christ. You're part of this local assembly. But at the same time, you're an individual has some responsibility of not just us together having a voice going out to the community, but your voice as an individual needs to be carrying the gospel out to the community. You need to be sharing the gospel. Sometimes we don't realize that that is our responsibility. And that green book, you can put it to the side right now, we're eventually going to use that because uh, that was actually written to help someone understand how to give the gospel. And uh, we're not going to talk so much talk about the gospel, although how to give it is going to incorporate that information. We want to, we're going to be today teaching you how to share the gospel. First of all, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Certainly if we as individuals aren't sharing it, the church corporate isn't going to be sharing it. But we as individuals have a responsibility and you need from, to know from Scripture that you do have a responsibility. Uh, others have testified that verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5 has been working in their mind. So in case it hasn't stirred you yet, I'll read it again to you. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do pray that we'll live for you and we'll understand just part of, of that today as we've been studying all different aspects of what living for you is all about. But Father, I pray we might be challenged not just to live, but also to speak for you and to uh, use our voice to share your gospel of your Son to all who you died for, which is everybody. Uh, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, the, the, the love of Christ constrained the Apostle Paul because he is called at a time when the whole world had turned from God. If you know anything from Bible, from your Bible in, in, in prior to the Apostle Paul, Gentiles had turned from God long ago. That's what the Tower of Babel was all about. We decided we didn't want God's knowledge. We didn't want the information about God. We had, we had turned away from the information that we knew about God. And we decided we'd invent our own religion. That's we Gentiles, the nations. And we invented all kinds of idolatry and images to worship. And to this day, people are still doing the same. And, uh, and us Gentiles had turned away from God. Then God took Abraham and made out of him a great nation. And it was that nation of Israel that they were going to have the true and living God be their God. And God was going to bless them so that the, us Gentiles, us ignorant Gentiles, would look to Israel and say, man, they have something different. Uh, we need to know about the God of Israel. His is a, theirs is a living God. Ours is made out of stone, out of wood. It's figment of our imagination. But they have a real God. And Israel was supposed to be God's testimony. And uh, when it came to their salvation, God sent His Son and they rejected His Son. They wouldn't have Jesus Christ reign over them. In fact, they said, we'll have Caesar reign over us. And they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And there came a time that even after that was part of their salvation, Christ had to die, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was offered to them as another opportunity for them to believe on Him and be God's people in this earth. But they continued to reject Jesus Christ and it came time for God to judge this world and pour out His wrath on this world who is a Christ-rejecting world. Us Gentiles and the Jews as well. We've all become dead in sins. But you realize God is not judging this world yet. There might be all kinds of terrible things that happen in this world, but we call them natural disasters. God has not broken out of, the, out of the heavens and poured out His wrath like the book of Revelation declares. And the reason why is that when all had sinned, God saved the Apostle Paul and gave him a message that when Christ died on the cross, He died for all. That there is another opportunity for the last 2,000 years 
for people to understand how great God's love is in the, in the fact that even though we've all rejected, Jesus Christ died and paid for our sins so there can be another opportunity given to us to believe and be saved before God does pour out His wrath. That's what Paul is contemplating in verse 14. The love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. All were dead. All were ready to be judged, condemned by God. But then he says, and that he died for all. And that is the constraining love of, of Christ that motivated the Apostle Paul to live for Jesus Christ and ought to motivate you as well as an individual to live for Christ. If you're having a problem living for Jesus Christ, you're not really appreciating your salvation. You're not really appreciating the fact that you just come that close to going to hell, to spending eternity in a lake of fire, that you deserve and by all rights you ought to be there suffering forever the consequence of your sin, and that is to totally deny God and His Word and not live for Him because you never have. You've broken His laws and, and, and you have not, there's a time that you did not receive His Son. Now, maybe some of you still have not received what Jesus Christ did in your behalf. What these verses are declaring is that when you were dead in sins, that Jesus Christ came and died for you. When it says He died for all, that's not that's that's Jew and Gentile, but that's you as an individual. That He paid for your sins. What you ought to experience for all eternity, Jesus Christ experienced on the cross, and He paid for your sins so that God could save you, forgive you of your sins, and give you everlasting life. And if you're not living for Him, you're not really appreciating what you have in Christ. But when you think about the great love that he had for you, that becomes your motivation not to live unto yourselves, but unto him that died for you and gave his life for you. That's verse 15. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. And that becomes the motivation now of why we ought to, how we ought to live our life. We ought to live it for him. He loved us. And, and he didn't say, okay, now if you live for me, I'll save you. He gave us the gift of eternal life. But that gift ought to become the motivation to say, well, there's no better way for me to live the rest of my life except for live it for Him. Now, if you live it for Him, the truth of the matter here is that He didn't just die for you. He died for all. And if you want to live for Jesus Christ, you know what Jesus Christ wants everyone today to know? That He loves them and that He died on the cross to pay for their sins and they can be forgiven of all their sins and given eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's what he wants everybody in this world to know. And if you already know that, well, good. But now if you want to live for Christ, you know what he wants other people to know? That same message that saved you. Which living for him incorporates not just living good, that does involve that. Living righteously, it does involve that. Spiritually being developed from God's word and having being motivated from God's word, it involves that. But the all the end result of that, and part of the end result of that, I should say, is also going out in the world and speaking for him and telling other people that they could be saved. Because he died for them. He wants them to know that. Verse 18 says, uh, it says, And all things are of God, who reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now, you see that word committed? That's a great responsibility. And we talk about and have been talking about in our Tuesday class about the Great Commission. And we're talking about the commissioning of the Twelve Apostles. But what God was commissioning them to do, what Jesus Christ commissioned them to do, is not what He's commissioned us to do. Here is our commission. We have been, He has committed to us the ministry and the word of reconciliation to explain how sinful man can be reconciled to a holy God because of what Jesus Christ did for them. Verse uh, 20 says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God. For he, that is God, hath made him, that is Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him that your sins could be placed on Jesus Christ because God made Jesus Christ to be sin for us. You, you need to realize what that is. He didn't, Jesus Christ, in dying for sin, just didn't die so you could be forgiven. God made him to be sin. That is, he took your sins and placed them on Jesus Christ 
And he was like a sinner on that cross. And because of that, God poured out his wrath and his judgment against, for your sins against Jesus Christ. So your sins were paid for at the cross. That's the message of reconciliation, of how a sinner can be reconciled to God because God made Jesus Christ to be sin for us. And Jesus Christ knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. If Jesus Christ took my sins and God made Him to be sin for me, what sin do I have left? None. When I trust Jesus Christ, God imputes the righteousness, the, the perfection of Jesus Christ. He puts it to my account. Christ takes my sin, I take His righteousness, and God sees me perfect in Christ, and I have everlasting life. That's all through what Jesus Christ did. And we have been committed that word and that message of reconciliation. And we need to think about the importance of that commitment. Our scripture reading, go back there to Romans chapter 10. Certainly this is the motivation for anybody who's what we call a missionary. But you ought to think of a missionary, not someone like the Kuipers who go to Brazil to share the gospel down there. A proper definition of a missionary is not someone who goes somewhere to preach the gospel. The proper definition of a missionary is someone who preaches the gospel as he goes somewhere. It don't matter where you go. You ought to be a missionary. You ought to be sharing the gospel wherever you go. And it don't have to be Brazil. There's all kinds of places here in America to share the gospel. There's all kinds of people going to church today that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They go to church and go through ceremonies and rituals trying to get their sins forgiven and they have no knowledge that Jesus Christ already 2,000 years ago took care of their sins. They have no knowledge. They're working and trying to establish their own righteousness with no knowledge that their righteousness is a gift from God. When they believe Jesus Christ, He imputes that righteousness to them. They're trying to work their way there. Well, look at Romans 10. And, and, you know, there, there was a time in my life where I struggled with the fact that, you know, there's so many religions and people out there almost preaching the gospel. You scratch your head and you say, who's saved and who's not saved? Until one day I was reading this passage and the answer was right there in the Bible for me. Here, look at Paul's in Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, here's a man with some compassion. We already read about the love of Christ constraining him as he thinks about what Christ did in behalf of all men. So he goes out to share the gospel with all men. But his heart is just aching for his own natural people, the nation of Israel. I think before your heart would ache for someone in Brazil and somewhere else in the world, that the people of your own nation ought to be a heartache for you. In fact, I think your own family ought to be the greatest heartache that you could have is the, the desire to see them saved. And Paul, he says his desire is that Israel would be saved. Doesn't that tell you Israel's not saved? Okay, now keep that in mind. Verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Now, a zeal of God means they're ambitious and hardworking, doesn't it? Apparently, ambition and hardworking doesn't save you. If they have a zeal of God, aren't they sincere? Absolutely sincere. But sincerity doesn't save you, does it? So work and ambition and sincerity doesn't make them saved. They have all that, but they're not saved. Verse 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Now here's the key of understanding the gospel and giving the gospel out. Being ignorant of God's righteousness. You know how righteous God is? He's absolutely righteous. The Bible says He's holy. Uh, Dave Lacina was saying he, that one of his favorite songs is Holy, Holy, Holy. It says that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, when the seraphim see Jesus Christ, they cry out, Holy, Holy, Holy. He's triune holy. He's three times holy. He is ho a holy God. His righteousness is absolute perfection. Not one sin. And you need to understand, Adam and Eve ate some fruit that God said don't eat of, and they were thrown out of the paradise of God. That's not a big deal, is it? It's not a big deal to you. It's not a big deal to me. It's a big deal to God. They sinned. And they didn't go commit adultery. They didn't commit murder and, murder. and they didn't lie. They just disobeyed God. And they were thrown out of the presence of God because of their sin. God is absolutely holy. No sin stands in the presence of God. 
Now, Israel, they were ignorant of God's righteousness. They were ignorant of the fact of how righteous God was. As a result, here's what they did. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is available through Jesus Christ, Him taking our sins, and when we believe on Him, His righteousness given to us. But because they're not thinking about how righteous God is, they're going about to establish their own righteousness. You know, th that means they're going through all the ceremonies, they're trying to keep all the laws that are in the Old Testament, they're, they're, the Bible says they've strained at a gnat, it's an unclean insect, so they strained their juice so they wouldn't drink a gnat because then they would sin against God. I mean, they were trying to live absolutely perfect. But you know what they're ignorant about? That no matter how hard they try, they could never come up to God's standard. They could never get there. They're trying harder than you ever thought of trying. They were trying. And no matter how hard they try, Isaiah says, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's how God looks at it. You think they were 100% obedient to God in everything? In everything they ever did? No, Jesus Christ came and those same people, He called them hypocrites right to their face. They even changed the commandment of God so that they could fulfill it. And, and he called them hypocrites. So rather than submitting themselves that from righteousness that comes from a gift through Jesus Christ, they went around to do it themselves. And as a result of that, they, did, they weren't saved. They, rather than submitting themselves unto the righteousness of God, they were going about to establish their own righteousness. As a result, they're unsaved. Verse 4 is the whole matter. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That's the end of the law right there. You're, he's the one who lived absolutely perfect. And you want to be righteous, it's in Jesus Christ. It's not in yourself. And so anyone who's going around trying to work off and pay for their own sins and deal with their own sins and offer to their God their own religious or their own moral works, they're lost. They're just like Israel, sincere but ignorant. Because no matter how good they think they are, they're filthy in God's sight. The only way to be saved, it's all in Christ. That's the end of it all. Amen. You come to Him and realize God made Him to be sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God, not our righteousness, the righteousness of God in Him. That's the goal. And that's a gift from God that's available to us. Now look down in the same chapter, look at verse 13. It says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What, what a person must do to be saved is realize they can't do it, call on God to do it. Trust God, that's, the, that's what this is all about. It's believing the message that was given uh, to Paul. A person to call on the name of the Lord, that whole understanding of calling on the name of the Lord is realizing, uh-oh, I'm lost. I need to be saved. And realizing it's Jesus Christ who can save me and saying, Lord, save me. And, and what you're doing in that, in that expression is you're trusting Jesus Christ as the one who died on the cross for your sins and believing God the Father that says, when you believe on my Son, I'll give you everlasting life. You're receiving that gift by calling on the name of the Lord. You're calling on Him to do what He said He would do, save you. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Whosoever. There's no person on this earth, contrary to even some people's doctrine, there's no one on this earth that God cannot save. There's no criminal. Jim was talking about going and, and seeing the lifestyle of some people that where he was visiting. Uh, I, I did some work for Mike Berry today, and I had to put soap dispensers in the youth home at Macomb County. They wouldn't leave me by myself, even in the children's section. In fact, we're, no one could figure out why I'm changing the soap dispensers, because I'm taking down brand new ones and putting brand new ones back up. It was in the youth section. This kid was only 12 years old. I'm talking to the guy who's standing with me because no one. I, I was always had to have a guard there, and and we're wondering why I'm putting in these new soap dispensers. And finally, the little kid says, "I know why." And so we turned to him and said, "Why?" He says, "Because the one you're putting in has to have a key. Everyone's hiding drugs inside the other ones. <laughs> they can open up the soap dispenser, put drugs in it, and shut it." <laughs> a little kid knows why, and the, the officials didn't know why I was doing what I was doing, but. But the, the kids there, all young, no one hardly looked over 14 years old. But all of them with the one section has real criminal uh, felony charges against them. And, and, and you look at all that and you realize how lost this world is, and yet the Bible says everybody is savable. God made, whatever they've done, Jesus Christ was made sin for them. 
Even they are savable. That's what grace is all about. You're going to find out that you're really no different in God's sight than they are. Amen. Our problem is we think we're better than them. But that's not true in God's sight. In God's sight, we're all sinners. And, and, uh, and so, verse 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's wonderful news, isn't it? Whosoever. But there's a problem. Look at the next verse. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Have you figured that out yet? Every, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, God will save them. But the question is, how could they call on him if they don't believe on him? Well, that's true. Then, then it asks another question. And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? How would they even know to call on him? They First, they don't believe, but the reason they don't believe, they've never heard about him. They've never heard this message that Jesus Christ took their sins and paid for them and w no matter what they've done, will forgive them of all their sins and give them everlasting life. They haven't heard that. Well, that brings us to the next question. And how shall they hear without a preacher? You got an answer for that? I don't think there is an answer for that except they got to hear through a preacher. Someone's got to say it so they can hear it, so they can believe it and respond and be saved. So someone's got to preach it. And it says, uh, And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So God does send. Who does he send? We just read, he has committed unto us the word and the ministry of reconciliation. Look, look over with me to 2 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is one of the first ones that made me aware of what I'm saying to you today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we do what? We speak. We speak. <laughs> Not as pleasing men, but God with try which trieth our hearts. But the first part of that, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel... God has not entrusted the gospel into the hands of angels to go into this world and tell the world about Jesus Christ. You know who he's entrusted with this message of the good news of salvation that's in Jesus Christ? Paul says it's us. He's entrusted to us this gospel. That is, he's counting on you. He's counting on me to share this message with other people. Because they can't believe until we preach it. But when they preach it, they can finally hear it they can finally believe it, and they can finally be saved. And so we're put in trust with the gospel. That's why he says, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men. You're not going to make every person happy when you go share the gospel with them. But God who tries our hearts. Realizing if we're going to live, we're not to live unto ourselves, but unto him. What does he want people to know is how to be saved. Who does he want to tell them? He wants you to tell them. If you know it, then it's your job now to tell it to someone else. And that's the only way that anyone is ever going to be saved. Well, if he's committed to us this message, and he has, and there's a, so, several other verses, maybe next time we can talk about some of those others. I want to get into talking about how to share the gospel. But I, I want you to know, too, there's really a few things that keep you from sharing it. Pride, number one. You care more your, what people think about you and your image in front of them than what they really need and what God wants you to tell them. Pride is one of the things that keeps you from sharing the gospel with someone. Oh, they're, they're going to think I'm a Bible freak. I'm going to think I'm a Jesus freak. Uh, you're worried about that because of your image. Well, you're supposed to be a servant. Fear is definitely one of the things that keep us from doing it. And that's why it says, uh, not, not uh, even so we preach, uh, not of pleasing men. <laughs> it, it does, it, whether they want to hear it or not, they need to hear it. It says to Jeremiah, when, he, when God sent Jeremiah to go out, he says, you're a young man. He said, don't be afraid of their face. You, know, you walk up to someone and say, I tell you something. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> you know, ah, never mind, next time. <laughs> you know, their fear is, a, is something there, but you've got to be motivated by God and the message to overcome the fear. And when the love of Christ constrains you, you'll overcome that fear. When you realize their need and the greatest thing you could ever do for them is to give them that gospel, you can overcome that fear. But fear keeps us from doing it. Rejection keeps us from doing it. Oh, they're, they're not going to believe. They're going to reject my message and I'm going to feel terrible. Well, your message is not to get them saved. The message will save them. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Your job, I should have said, not message, your job is to tell them. That's all. You're just supposed to speak. 
And then they have to make a decision whether to accept it or not. So they're not rejecting you when they reject the gospel. They're rejecting Jesus Christ. You're just, your job is just to give the message out. And I don't believe Paul spent much time with people who rejected the message. I do read once in a while where he persuaded men. So maybe he gave them a second, now listen, you're not hearing me, you're going to go to hell if you don't trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. So maybe he did some persuading. But when I watch Paul, he goes, presents the gospel, people turn it down, he goes the next place. All he did is speak it. It's, re, it's Christ. They're either accepting or they're rejecting. You know, if some of your fear is the idea of ignorance, you know, I'm afraid because I'm not sure what to say or how to say it, well, you know, that can be overcome, can it? <laughs> By what we're doing right now. How do we share the gospel? And, uh, and, and so we need to get into that. Take your green book. This book was actually written, it wasn't intended to be a booklet. It was written back when there was a person attending here who wanted to go on visitation, and he was a young believer, and he said to me, so I'm not really sure I know how to give the gospel to someone. And I realized in his, in his young uh, growth of, as a Christian that, that he needed some help. So I sat down and I wrote him out a way of presenting the gospel. But I didn't want him to be mechanical and do it like I would do it. I wanted him to be able to do it on his own. So what I did is I gave him some things to think about of what he's trying to express to someone as he shares the gospel. And, and, and then I gave him several verses. If you'll notice, like on page 3, as you're looking on the right-hand side, uh, right-hand side of the page there, that uh, there's a bunch of underlined verses. The reason those are underlined, I underlined them for him because I wanted him to read about what he's trying to get across, and then, and then here's the biblical references that say these things are true. And I told him, you read those, and particularly if you're not going to read everyone, read the underlined ones, and, and see which one speaks to your heart, then memorize that verse and use it when you share the gospel. But rather than him share the one I share, there's several times the Bible says these things, the one that speaks to you, memorize it and you share it. Well, when Jim and I put this in a booklet form, Jim having uh, the Bible in his computer, we print it out on the back and we turn the words around where it speaks to the person rather than tells a person how to share the gospel, it speaks to the lost person. And that's the, so that the booklet is a little bit reversed from how I originally wrote it. And, uh, and, but, but you have this information here. And, and when you read it, you'll understand what it is that you need to convey to, in order to get someone saved to understand the gospel. And, uh, and so if you look at page two, this whole booklet involves seven questions. Five of them get the person saved. The last two is after they get saved. So as you and I talk about how to share the gospel with another person, we're going to think about these five questions that are written there and realizing that these questions are the things that we need to convey in order to get someone to be saved. In fact, it was, it's quite interesting. At one of the conferences I went to, they were having an evangelism course Doug Dodd was teaching it from uh, Edgewater, Florida, and I emailed him and asked me, I asked him, send me that five statements that you were saying people have to know in order to be saved. And he sent them to me, and I looked at those five, and I looked at these, the first five on here, they're identical, only they're just said a different way. Uh, I'll give you a copy of this next time. Right now, you might want to write it next to it, but look at number one there, where it says, why, why would I need to be saved? I am not such a bad person. Well, you realize if you're going to go to talk to someone about being saved, before they can ever be saved, they have to know they're lost, don't they? Doesn't the average person think he's good enough to go to heaven? I've been enough in prison ministry to realize that most prisoners in jail think they're good enough to go to heaven. That means everybody outside of heaven thinks they're good enough to go to heaven. Remember the verse? They being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness... If you set the standard of what it takes to go to heaven, everybody will make it, won't they? Well, at least you'll make it because you'll set the standard below you and I'm better than this, so I'm going. But if you let the guy in prison set the standard, he'll say, well, if you don't kill five people, you can go to heaven. You know, everybody's going to set the standard just under them so they get in. You don't set the standard. You know what the standard is for heaven? Absolute perfection. Absolute perfection. God doesn't dwell in the presence of holiness. You, without even a whole bunch of biblical understanding, you know the story of Adam and Eve, and don't use the fact they ate an apple, just say they ate fruit. It's called the, fruit, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They disobeyed God and ate a fruit and were kicked out of the presence of God, kicked out of paradise, just for that disobedience. It doesn't take lying, it doesn't take murder, it doesn't take adultery to be a sinner in God's sight. 
dis, any disobedience to God. And so a person needs to know that they need to be saved, and the way they need to know they be saved, they have to realize what God's standard is. Uh, what, what Doug Dodd wrote down is, number one, they must know they are a sinner. So you need to convey that to someone. And you can convey it by explaining things, and you need to find a Bible verse that says they're a sinner. You're in the book of Romans? No, we left Romans, didn't we? Go back to Romans. In fact, one of the ways of sharing the gospel is called the Romans Road. So go back to Romans chapter 3. Now, hope, hopefully you're understanding here that sharing the gospel is not proving you're, you're smarter than they are, that you know more Bible than they do, that your religion's right and their religion's wrong. It has nothing to do with any of that stuff. It has to do with the fact that these people can be saved and have eternal life, and you've already learned from God's Word how that is possible, and how free it is, and how gracious God is in giving it, and what Jesus Christ did in order for a person to have it, and what you're, you're doing is you're not trying to convert them to religion. You're trying to share the gospel so they can be saved. And the biblical term for that is preaching the gospel. So they must know that they're a sinner. How else will they ever learn to how to be saved unless they realize they have a need? Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now that one little verse is a verse that you can make it real clear when you're talking to someone that they are a sinner. You know, you, you don't want to too much be asking questions when you talk to someone, but sometimes you do ask them, how good do you think a person must be to get to heaven? And they'll give you some kind of answer. And then you, you could say, well, do you know you have to be absolutely perfect to go to heaven? I've had one or two tell me they've made it. They're still good enough. They're absolutely perfect. And, uh, and so I had to then rely on the Bible verse to tell them that the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's easy when you're talking to someone and you point out they're a sinner to get the pressure off them, you just turn back and say, I'm a sinner too. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it, that's the first thing you need to convey to someone is that they are a sinner. But then after you convey that they're a sinner, look at point number two there. Well, okay, I'm not perfect. And yes, I have sinned against God. What penalty does that bear? Okay, so I'm not perfect. I'm pretty good, I'm not perfect, but I'm still pretty good, and, and, and I have sinned, so what? Well, so what means you're going to be cast from the presence of God for all eternity. That a sinner is indeed going to hell. They need to realize, if you're going to call on the name of the Lord, the idea there is, is wanting, desiring to be saved. Well, they have to know what they're saved from. They're not just saved from sin. They're saved from an eternity, eternal separation from God. And, and verses that would indicate that is like Romans chapter 6. You might not want to read the last part of the verse immediately, or you want to quote to them the first part of that verse that says, the wages of sin is death. And death in your Bible, Adam and Eve were told, the day they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God says you will surely die. Then you can read uh, three chapters later how they lived to be 930 years old. And then you realize, you know, death doesn't mean physical death. Death in the Bible means separation from God. Death, the word means separation. And when you physically die, your spirit and soul leave this body. And that's why we take this body and put it in the ground. There's no life in it anymore. The life has left the body. But when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, it's not talking about that the payment for your sin is physical death. Adam and Eve died the day they ate of that tree. What happened to them? They were cast out of the presence of God. They were no longer allowed in his paradise. They had sin on themselves and they were separated from God. And to die in your sin is to spend eternity separated from God. The Bible calls that a place of outer darkness. It calls it a place of eternal torment. It's a place where the fire, the, the fire is not, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. To have sin on you and to die and stand before a holy God would be to be cast eventually in what the Bible calls the lake of fire. Look over, we're going to leave Romans, I, I didn't mean to do this, but look over, you need to know this verse. It's one I've used quite often, Revelation chapter 21. I use this on people who think they're pretty good. It says in Revelation 21 in verse 8, it not only will tell them a sinner, it tells them what penalty it bears. It says... Uh, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable 
and murderers and whoremongers and idolaters and all liars have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Not just physical death, second death, a lake of fire. Who goes into that lake of fire? Oh, whoremongers go in the lake of fire, right? Look at that list. Murderers, yeah, they go in that lake of fire. Last one on that list, and all liars. You going to tell me you never told a lie before? How many times you got to lie to become a liar? <laughs> that makes you a liar. <laughs> all liars. So not only do you learn from that verse that you are a sinner, now you know what penalty it bears. The second death, the lake of fire, separation from God for all eternity in a place of torment. Now, if a person has any interest at all, they want to hear some good news. You shared enough bad news, right? Look at, look at the next thing, number three there, in the booklet. According to the standards of the Bible, absolute perfection, right? <laughs> According to the standards of the Bible, no matter how hard I try, I'll never make it, will I? Absolutely not. You can't make it there by trying. By doing your best, trying, you can't do it. That's why salvation is not by works. Uh, one of the verses, if you have the book of Romans there, Romans chapter 4 is a very excellent passage to show them. We just read how Israel, going about to establish their own righteousness, were still lost. They weren't saved. Romans chapter 4 says in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you're going to try to pay off your own sins by doing your good works, well, then you don't get God's grace, undeserved, unmerited favor. You don't get that mercy Jim sang about or the grace which is even greater than mercy. You don't get that. It, the reward of working is not grace, but a debt. If you want to pay for your own sins, work off your own sins, that's what the lake of fire is all about. That's where sins are going to be paid for. But remember, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that's exactly what he was doing for us. He died for us. He was paying for our sins. Number four in your booklet, how can Jesus Christ save me of my sins? We've already been looking at the verses that says Christ died for our sins. Look at Romans chapter 4. Look at, look at verse uh, 21. Romans 4.21. It says, And being fully persuaded that what he has promised, he was also able to form. I should start in verse 22. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed, that his righteousness was imputed, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed, watch this, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses. Jesus Christ died for the offenses that we've done against God and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a payment for sin, and when we believe on that, His righteousness is imputed, given to us. Not earned, worked for, given to us. Look at Romans 5, look at verse uh, 6. It says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely would a righteous man, for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God can save us from our sins. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Wages is what you work for, Right? The gift you don't work for, you receive it freely. But the reason you re receive it freely, Christ paid for it for you. He died for your sins. He paid for your sins when he died on the cross. He was delivered up for your offenses, and he paid for those offenses. And on the cross, Jesus Christ paid your penalty of sin so that you could be saved. Now, that's what you need to convey to a person. They need to understand, they all know Christ died, and he died on the cross for our sins, but now they're going out trying to get rid of their sins without believing what that message is, that, that their sins have been paid for, and that now salvation is a gift to them that's through Jesus Christ. And what they must do, according to Romans 4, 24, or Romans 5, 1, is that they have to make a decision of believing. How are they going to get saved? How can they call on Him in whom they have not believed? 
Now that, now that they understand what Christ did, they're still not saved, are they? And here's where I worry about a lot of you people. I know I've shared the gospel so much, you can tell me the gospel back. But I don't know that if you have if made a difference to you, that you yourself have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I can only tell you how to be saved. You have to decide, well, that's what I'm going to believe in. I'm going to trust Jesus Christ. Only you can make that decision. If I could put that in you, I would. If I could put it in every person I talk to, I would. But after you explain the gospel, a person needs to realize that they have to make a decision. And you have to tell them that. Don't just give them the gospel, tell them what Christ did, tell them that doesn't save you. It's believing on that that saves you. That's why, verse. look at that verse uh, 24. But to us also, to whom that is righteousness shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. To be, you're going to have to believe on him, not on yourself. Believe on him and what God did through him. That's believing on him. Look at chapter 5, verse 17. It says... For by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they that receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Who reigns in life with Jesus Christ? They that receive the abundance of grace. Once they hear the message, now they're going to have to receive that message. How do you receive it? You believe on it. You believe it to be true. You accept it from God in the sense that you're receiving what He has done for you and what Jesus Christ has done, what God said Christ accomplished. You're by faith receiving that gift of eternal life. And after a person hears the gospel, you need to tell them that they have a choice to make. If they tell you, like they did at Athens, we'll hear you again about this later, did they make a choice? Absolutely, they made a choice. They made a choice not to trust in Jesus Christ at that point. They said, I'll, receive, I'll talk to you about it later. They are making a choice. Once you present that gospel, a choice is being made. Either, yes, I believe and I'll be saved. Or, no, at this time I'm going to choose not to accept Christ right now. I'm not going to trust in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to receive the gift of eternal life. Let's talk about it again another time. But they made a choice that day. And at the next second they would die. They would spend eternity in a lake of fire. Because they re refused the gift that God offered them through Jesus Christ. And we'll deal with this again at time we really went by fast. There's some more verses I want to show you and more things I want to talk to you about in ways of presenting the gospel. So two weeks from today, we'll pick this back up. In the meantime, start practicing it. Read this so that you can learn how to present the gospel and perhaps use it as well to pass it out as a gospel track. First, make sure you're saved. And then go tell someone else. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I thank you for the interest that everyone showed as we talked about this thing that's been committed to our trust, the Word and the ministry of reconciliation. Father, what a wonderful gift you've given to us in Christ. What a shame for any man, woman, child to die without knowing it. And Father, we pray that we might be bold to open our mouths as we ought to and share this wonderful good news that people need to know whether they want to hear it or not. Help us just to be faithful to you to share it with them. For their good, all for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.